Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. And this week, actually on Monday, marked the 300th birthday of probably forgotten founder to most, for founding father Roger Sherman. I think he was one of the most important founders and also one that very few people know about. So on this episode, I want to go through some of the highlights of his life, his humble beginnings, his involvement in, depend in independence and the Declaration, and even his work on the Constitution for the United States, things like sound money, representation by the states, uh, the Tenth Amendment, the Bill of Rights, and more. I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. It should be a pretty uh, short episode today, but I appreciate you being here. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the Tenth Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the archives. Uh, for over two and a half years, closing in on three years this summer, on individual episodes like this one, I will link to stuff that I'm talking about so you can read it in context and learn more on your own time. You can find all the different platforms. We live stream on primarily the mainstream ones like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and Twitter. We also are live streaming on DLive. Hopefully we'll be on Hyper and Odyssey.com as well soon, but we have archives at Gab and Brighteon and BitChute and Minds and sometimes MeWe and the podcast edition on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podbean, and elsewhere. You can also find our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month. All that and more over at the show homepage, which is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And as I'm mentioning membership program, I want to say a quick shout out and a big thank you to just a handful of a number of people who signed up to put their support behind our work. There's Rose in Arizona, Tom in California, Walter in New Hampshire, Thomas in Texas, Barbara also in Arizona, and Richard in Pennsylvania. We are, and I speak on behalf of everybody who works with the TAC, volunteers, supports our effort, we couldn't be more grateful for your support. And while we're allowing people another moment or so to join us and get notifications for the live stream, I want to say hello to everyone out in the live chat. There's Patricia up in Syracuse. Erwin Havernick says, all hail the algorithmic overlords. That's pretty funny. Uh, Richard Banks, Dixie Strong, Tyler B., Rachel Menard, Bob Brewer in Tyler. Good to see you, Bob. Alan Mosley says, short episode compared to what? <laughs> That's a good point. I might ramble on, and this could be the longest one ever. Alan Hughes. Uh, Alcy Play TV, Murray Ray, and everyone else. I appreciate you being here. Hi to Blue North Wind. I apologize if I missed anybody, but let's get right to this. And as I usually do for almost every episode marking the anniversary of a historical event, let's start out with a blog post by Dave Benner. We published this one, and he posts these updates almost every single year on the anniversary. This is one, Today in History, Founding Father Roger Sherman, born, which we published in 2019. And here's how Dave starts it. On April 19th, 1721, that's 300 years ago, just this week, Roger Sherman was born. A pivotal figure of the American founding period, he was one of only two people to sign the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution. The only other person was Robert Morris. We don't really hear too much about either of those guys, and I should probably cover Morris at some point as well. He also signed the Continental Association, sometimes called the Association. Morris didn't, making Sherman the only one to sign all four of those documents. I mean, that's pretty major, the fact that he had participated in all those efforts leading up uh, to the revolution through the ratification of the Constitution. John Dickinson signed three of four, but not the Declaration. So this is the only guy to sign all four of those. Here from Wikipedia, he really had very humble beginnings. And Dave point that, points that out in his blog as well. And they put it this way. Sherman was born into a family of farmers in Newton, Massachusetts, near Boston. His education did not extend beyond his father's library. From my understanding, it was pretty extensive, though. He had access, and uh, there was some help in that library and grammar school. And his early career was spent as a shoemaker. This is not a guy who was bo born into a lot of uh, property and wealth and access and Harvard and things like that. But somehow, he studied so much that he was actually, he had no formal legal training. But as I've mentioned in a previous episode, a lot of the founders, even if they didn't, 
they had such a great understanding of history and of law and things like that, more so than we do today. We're just relying on experts all the time to tell us what is and what isn't the truth on everything. But the founding generation, they were more kind of learn it on your own. And Sherman studied law so much that someone actually encouraged him to read for the bar exam, a local lawyer. And he was actually admitted to the bar of Litchfield, Connecticut in 1754. He was in his early 30s and he just studied so much that he was qualified to serve on the bar. He wrote a caveat against injustice and was chosen to represent New Milford in the Connecticut House of Representatives from 1755 to 58, and again from 1760 to 1761. He had a bunch of other jobs that brought him some recognition as being a respected local leader. And then once the revolutionary or the pre-revolutionary period came up, let's look at 1773, the announcement, and this is from ConnecticutHistory.org, the announcement of the 1773 Tea Act motivated Sherman to declare his belief, quote, that no laws bind the people, but such as they consent to be governed by. This isn't pure voluntarist, but at least he's taking the notion that there no one has a divine right to impose laws upon the people. He's taking this very strong revolutionary position. Others like uh, James Otis, Samuel Adams, and the like all held this principle of you have to have the consent consent of the governor governed. And I think this was in a letter to Thomas Cushing, but I haven't actually located it to uh, uh, to verify that for sure. Anyways, they go on and say his reputation of service to the colony, along with his strong patriot sentiment, got him as elect got him elected as a delegate to the first Continental Congress. And here from Constituting America, they actually count him as the only person to sign five important documents. And we'll get to that in just a moment. In the First Continental Congress, Sherman agreed with and signed the two key documents created by this legislative body, which signaled to King George that the colonists were not happy subjects. I guess that's a pretty chill way of putting it. One of these was a petition to the king, which outlined grievances against parliament, but largely held the king blameless. Like, oh, look what these people are doing in your name, king. You got to put a stop to this. And the other was the Articles of so Association, sometimes called the Continental Association, which implemented a boycott on English trade. And they actually created deadlines. If you don't do this by this time, we're going to implement this boycott, and then we're going to ramp it up from there. It was over a period of almost a year. And then from there... Uh, by May 1775, again, from Constituting America, the relationship, they say, with England was getting worse. And the fight at Lexington and Concord, which we know we just had the anniversary of, uh, had already happened. Consequently, they write, the colonies convened the Second Continental Congress because Sherman did such a great job in the first one. He was chosen by Connecticut to represent the state again. A year into this convention, with no hope for a reconciliation with England, a committee of five, the very important committee of five, that's Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Robert Livingston, Roger Sherman, and Thomas Jefferson, they were selected to draft what became the Declaration of Independence. So Roger Sherman uh, participated very early on in the First and Second Continental Congress. He was on the committee that drafted, we all think of Thomas Jefferson as being the author of the Declaration of Independence. I think he's better uh, represented as being the primary drafter. It was partly a team effort, even though there's a lot of Jefferson's pros in there. Going further, Dave Benner's blog again, he says, during the 1770s and 80s, a money catastrophe consumed the fledgling republic. Of course, paper notes have always been a problem. Fiat currency is a problem all through history. He says, as the debasement of money became a pressing issue in the critical period, Sherman maintained a hardline dedication to bullion. He was a sound money guy through and through. Dave goes on, he says, a noteworthy hard money warrior. He wasn't just a guy who said, well, we should probably do this. He was hardcore on this. The New Englander proposed a clause in the Philadelphia Convention that prohibited the printing of paper money at both the state and federal level. While some clung to the belief, Dave writes, that fiat should be embraced at the will of the states, 
It was Sherman's vision that won out. And this was actually on August 28th, 1787 in the Philadelphia Convention. I'm pulling this up from libertyfund.org, which of course I will link to in the show notes at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It says Mr. Wilson, that's James Wilson, and Mr. Sherman, Roger Sherman, moved to insert after the words coin money, the words nor emit bills of credit, nor make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debt. So as James Wilson and Roger Sherman, these are both Federalists. Sherman actually, he was, it was interesting, and I'm not really getting into this today, but Sherman actually thought that writing, drafting a new constitution was not what was authorized for the Philadelphia Convention. He thought both uh, maybe he thought it was okay legally, but he thought in a practical sense, the best approach to actually reject or kind of do an end run around potential objections to a new document. He said they should just revise the Articles of Confederation. He wanted just to see amendments. He wasn't necessarily as big of a big government guy as some of the people, but he wasn't really a full anti-federalist either. So he was in favor of the Constitution, but he wanted to actually create some structural limits. He actually encouraged just amending the Articles, and then once that wasn't going to happen, he worked to do things like banning the printing of paper money and make nothing other than gold and silver coin, a tender of payment in debts. And that was in Article 1, Section 10. And they go on and say they that make these position, prohibitions absolute instead of making the measures allowable. That's from Mr. Wilson and Mr. Sherman on August 28, 1787. Going further, Sherman thought, quote, this is a favorable crisis for crushing paper money. I thought that was kind of a Gary V statement, crush it, but I guess they were using this back in the 18th century as well. Sherman wanted to crush paper money. Back to Dave, and he actually takes a different perspective on this. I'm not sure, this is, in my opinion, I don't think this is his most important contribution, but Dave actually has a very good perspective on this as well. He says, perhaps most importantly, Sherman considered the proper role of the American president as, quote, nothing more than an institution for carrying the will of the legislature into effect. He thought that the executive should only execute or preside over things, execute the laws or preside over stuff. This wasn't going to be a unitary executive like we see today that had the power to create policy on the on their own whim and then change it based on who's in office. He thought, like so many others, that centralization or consolidation of power was incredibly dangerous to liberty. You couldn't have liberty as long as one person was making these decisions. That's what the revolution was all about. You couldn't deal with this kind of stuff. Consolidation was a problem. Dave goes on, he says, Dave makes a pretty good case here. Believing that the executive should carry a subdued role as the general agent of the states, he shunned the notion that a singular executive should possess as much power as an hereditary as a hereditary monarch. And I would say the executive today has far more power than the hereditary monarchs of that time back then. Now, in June and July of 1787, during that Philadelphia convention, if we're backing up just a little bit, there was actually um, a deadlock. There was a deadlock, and I covered this talking about my episode uh, just last week on the Three-Fifths Compromise. I should link to that in the show notes. I'll do my best to remember that as well. But there was a deadlock over how to set up representation for the states and for the people in the House of Representatives and in the uh, Senate. A number of the smaller states primarily were ready to withdraw by early July. They were just going to pull out. The whole thing was going to be done. The convention was over. There was going to be no new constitution. And so Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth worked together. And Ellsworth ended up being the third chief justice of the Supreme Court. He was nominated by George Washington or appointed by George Washington, also from Connecticut. They worked together to create something we could call either the Connecticut Compromise the Great Compromise, or it's also called the Sherman Compromise. And here from the Connecticut Judiciary, Judicial Branch website, they put it this way. This is just a quick summary, and I actually could do a full episode on the Connecticut Compromise at some point. The Compromise, they say, provided for a bicameral legislature, so House and Senate, with representation in the House of Representatives according to population, and in the Senate by equal numbers for each state. This was the deal that they made that said, okay, 
we're not going to end this discussion. We're going to work through this. Otherwise, it was almost over at that point. Sherman's compromise, they write, was adopted on July 16th, 1787 by a vote of five states to four. It was really close and served not only to save the crumbling convention, but provided stimulus to resolve other issues yet to be decided. So this was considered the great compromise, the Sherman compromise, and it was uh, really what got things over the finish line at that point. Back to Benner, he writes, during the ratification cam campaign, so after they were done in 1787, of course, there were all the debates to explain what the uh, constitutional powers were going to be, what that all meant. Advocating for it was Sherman, of course. He insisted, Dave writes, that the states retained all powers not expressly delegated. I often look to people like, of course, Jefferson and Madison as being original er old school tenthers, but more recently, in recent years, I've discovered Heavily, people like John Hancock and Samuel Adams, and even more recently, Roger Sherman was one of the original Tenthers before the Tenth Amendment ever even existed. This, uh, this understanding of delegated and reserved powers was part of the document, as James Wilson pointed out in October in his State House Yard speech, October 6, 1787, that this was different than all the other constitutions really ever considered before, that all those powers not delegated were automatically reserved instead of the other way around. And here's how Sherman put it. The powers vested in the federal government are only such as respect the common interest of the union and are particularly defined. Those of you who follow Founders Quotes or the things that we post on our social channels pretty regularly, you're probably familiar with James Madison's Federalist 45 statement of the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those reserved to the state governments are numerous and indefinite. But that was weeks later, after Sherman's letter that Dave is citing here of December 8th, 1787. We still don't know who it was addressed to, but it was sent somewhere and somewhere someone got that. But this was a general understanding that the federal government would only have few and defined powers and they were expressly delegated in the document. He also went on and said, each state retains its sovereignty. The people of each state held final authority. Sovereignty meant final authority in what respects its own internal government. And here again from that same letter of December 8th, 1787, he says, all acts of the Congress not warranted by the Constitution would be void. We had a great comment uh, on our Facebook channel by Jay, I believe, the other day saying, like, look, every time they do something outside the Constitution, outside the delegated powers of the Constitution, it's already void. And then, of course, our work today is how to make it null and void in practice. And this is the same vision that Roger Sherman had back in December of 1787. He said, look, as soon as they do this, you have to consider it void. And then he says, nor could they be enforced contrary to the sense of a majority of the states. He was anticipating that when the federal government went beyond the Constitution, it would try to enforce it. It would still, even though it's void, it's supposed to be in theory, in principle, and under the Constitution, those acts are void. But because the states, the people of the states, would resist implementation of that, not participate it, they wouldn't be able to do that. If you have a majority of the states saying, no, we are not participating in this, then, of course, they couldn't enforce it. And he goes on, he says, when the government overleaps those bounds, the bounds of the Constitution, and interferes with the rights of the state governments, the states will be powerful enough to check it. So we can't just wave a document at the federal government and say, oh, well, sorry, that's void. You can't do this. You're not authorized. Of course, we can say that to, because we want to rally people to the cause, but there are tools in the states to actually check and stop these things. Going to Dave again for a quick summary, he says, several years later, Sherman supported the 10th Amendment. What a surprise. He's basically making the 10th Amendment argument uh, back in 1787. Of course, he was going to be on board with it for ratification in the Bill of Rights on the grounds, quote, that such a principle, and this is from Dave, I'm quoting, that such a principle had already been guaranteed implicitly through the ratification of the unamended Constitution. I men mentioned James Wilson, of course, who worked with Sherman to get Article 1, Section 10, gold and silver, 
as money, not fiat paper money. But James Wilson in October of 1787 specifically told us, like, look, this is the document in and of itself. It is a document of, a, of delegated and reserved powers. What's not been delegated is automatically reserved to the states and to the people. And that's the same principle that Sherman held during the drafting and ratification or the debate in the House in Congress over the proposed Bill of Rights. And going further, Dave writes, instead of aligning with Madison's original proposal to incorporate the amendments into the main body of the Constitution, that's what Madison wanted to do. He just wanted to kind of put it, spread it out through the original Constitution text. Sherman persuaded Congress to enumerate them in a list at the end of the document. So not only did he sign the Constitu Con Continental Association, he was on the Committee of Five. He drafted the deck, helped draft the Declaration of Independence. He signed, and he actually, I believe, and I haven't been able to verify this, but I, I know we generally credit John Dickinson for his, I think it was like the fourth draft for the Articles of Confederation. He's primarily the guy that we look to to say, this is the drafter of the Articles of Confederation. But each state sent one representative at that time to come up with a committee to propose a number of different uh, revisions to it originally. And Sherman was part of that as well. I'm not sure how involved he was in the uh, drafting of the Articles of Confederation, but he was also participating in that. He was very influential. He signed that document. He was influential on some very important parts of the Constitution for the United States. He was very influential on the Bill of Rights, and yet few people actually know anything about him. So I'm hoping that this is kind of a nice overview of his life. If you're actually interested in another podcast, Dave Benner did a good one a few years ago called Roger Sherman, Forgotten Founder. I will link to his SoundCloud episode on that as well. It's 20 minutes, and it's probably covering a lot of the same stuff. I haven't listened to it in a few years, but uh, I thought of it again when he posted on his Facebook profile the other day. Hey, check out this podcast. I'm like, all right. So um, I've linked to that as well. I'll probably listen to it sometime today, see how far off we are from each other on our overview of Sherman's life. Now, Sherman ended up dying at the age of 73, way too young, 72, I think in 1793. And Thomas Jefferson supposedly said, and I haven't been able to find the actual text of this, but we see it all over. Even the great historian on Sherman's life doesn't even dispute that this was said. A man, he described Sherman as, quote, a man who has never said a foolish thing in his life. Now, Sherman was not considered a good speaker. Of course, neither was Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, John Adams would oftentimes make fun of someone like Roger Sherman. Adams was kind of a jerk, but he would make fun of Sherman for not being able to speak very well. But people like Jefferson and many others really, really considered what he had to say very important. And there was someone in Massachusetts, I think it was Fisher Ames, at some point said, like, look, even if I missed a debate in the House of Representatives and I needed to vote on something, I would not have to abstain because, and I'm paraphrasing, because I would just look to Roger Sherman. And if he took a position on it, I knew it was consistent with the Constitution and I could roll with that. Now, I don't want people to play follow the leader like that, but I think this is an example of how people, even when they disagreed with him, really respected what he had to say. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope you learned something. I hope it was fun to watch or listen to. Let me take a quick look over in the live chat and see if there's any uh, questions or comments that I can get to. Erwin Havernick said, fully audit the Fed, then end it. Yes, absolutely. Or just uh, find ways to undermine and nullify it as well. Rachel, Men Rachel Menard says, it's always great lesson today. I appreciate it. It's not super, super in-depth, but I hope uh, you found it interesting as well. Bob Brewer says, I'm not sure if I get that. More in the Fed. Travis and Lee Summit. Irwin also says Sherman is a genuine founder. I mean, if you think about how old school this was and how old, how many things he participated in, that's probably part of how he and people like Benjamin Franklin garnered so much respect when they had something to say because they had been through it all. Samuel Adams and many others. When they spoke about something, uh, Ryan Lopez says, I learned that Sam Adams was a jerk. No, Samuel Adams was a really nice guy. It's his cousin, John, who was kind of the jerk. Anyways, good to see you, buddy. Uh, Ryan is a great friend who lives here locally, and he's part of the uh, LP LA County. Anyways, 
I'm going to take a look in the live chat a little bit later and read through comments in the archive. I will reply to as many as I can. You can also email me questions or suggestions for future episodes at team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Of course, if you support the show and you want to help us spread the word, there's a few free, easy peasy things that you can do, like smash the like button, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform. Uh, leave a comment, share a link, uh, subscribe, get notifications. All that stuff triggers the algorithm of the mainstream platforms, and it tells that platform to show the program to more people. And of course, if you want to join our membership program, I've got our handy-dandy 110% Tenther membership card that goes to all annual members. You can also get a monthly membership for as little as two bucks a month over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash members. Please don't feel any obligation to do that. We're going to continue doing this for free, just like we have over 10,000 articles and blogs on our website for the last 15 years, all for free. We like to make the education available so people can learn and take action to support the Constitution and liberty. But we absolutely can't get the job done without your help. So if you have the ability to do so, any consideration you can give to joining us as a member would be greatly appreciated. Uh, that's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending a little bit of your time with me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.